Shalom, Shalom Yasharala. This is your brother Manatazak from Nations of Kings and Priests with another Bible bite. This time I have company. I have another mighty brother in the spirit here. Introduce yourself, brother. Brother Paul here coming to you from Nations and Kings and Priests. Khan. So we're going to bring out the prayer of Azariah, right? For anyone who doesn't know uh, the, who Azariah is, he was one of the three Hebrews who they call Abednego from Meshach, Sadrach, and Abednego from the three Hebrews in the book of Daniel. So we're going to give a little context. We're going to start in the book of Daniel in chapter three, brother. You can start in chapter three, verse five. Daniel chapter three and verse five. That at what time ye hear the sound of the clarinet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the parsley, Clamor and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king have set up. Come. So what's happening here is the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up a new god in his territory, and he wants all of those in attendance who he invited to bow the knee and give praise and worship to this new god. And these brothers are there. Right. So before we start this class, I want to just give all praises and all glory to Yahweh in the name of Hamashiach Yahweh Shai, the true God, the true creator, our father in heaven. Right. So now let's get back to this. Nebuchadnezzar King is given instruction that after you hear these instruments, that you are to bow your head and you are to worship and bend the knee to this God. Right. So that's what's happening in verse five. So let's also drop down to verse 14, please. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar speak and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo, do not ye serve my gods? Time. Jump to verse 16 also. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Khan, hold right there. So if you notice, he, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is telling these brothers, right, that, that they're going to bow down. He's not asking or requesting. He's telling them. And these brothers are letting him know so that there's no misunderstanding. We're not going to be careful on how we answer you. We're letting you know that we are not going to bow the knee to this God or to your gods, right? So go ahead, brother. We're going to go all the way to verse 20. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Huh. So these brothers are making it known. They know what the, the consequence of not bowing the head means to, to this. They know that this means being thrown in the furnace. They know that this could mean their lives. But they don't, they don't care about that. They care about worshiping and fearing the Most High first. Is there any more on that? Huh. Verse 19 then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and from of his vengeance was ch changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Therefore he speak and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Verse 20, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Khan. So the king was so upset. He felt humiliated and he felt embarrassed in front of all these people that these three Hebrews would not bow the knee. Not only that, these Hebrews have positions of power within the kingdom that he gave them himself, right? So now he has to make an example out of them, out of this embarrassment and out of this rebellious attitude that they have towards him. But the reality is that they're just obeying the laws and the, and the statutes of their God, Yahweh, right? So now we're going to go into what happens after that, right? So we're going to go now into the Apocrypha. And in this Apocrypha, it says the prayer of Azariah. But in other Apocryphas, it's going to mention the, the children, the three Hebrew children, right? So we're going to go into there and we're going to start at verse 1. 
Acts, right? And it says, and they walked in the midst of the fire, praising God and blessing the Lord. Now, I want you to understand that this is a prayer that was happening. As it was happening, these prayers were going out between these brothers to the Most High, right? And it says, and blessing the Lord. Then Azarias stood up and prayed on this manner and opening his mouth in the midst of the fire said, blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers. Thy name is worthy to be praised and glorified forevermore. For thou art righteous in all the things that thou hast done to us. Yea, true are all thy works. Thy ways are right and thy judgments truth. Right? So we see that even though they're praying, they're admitting that whatever judgments fall upon them, that they are deserving of these things. Because as a nation, our people... At this point, Jerusalem was sinning against the Most High, and that was the point of being in captivity under Nebuchadnezzar the king, because the Most High sent him against them to punish them. So they understood this, and they understood that they might have to pay with their lives. So that's why he's saying this, right? If we go to verse 5, it says, In all the things that thou hast brought upon us, and upon the holy city of our fathers, even Jerusalem, Thou has executed true judgment, right? Brother, let me get Psalms 119.42. So it says, Thou has executed true judgment, for according to truth and judgment didst thou bring all these things upon us because of our sins. Get that for me, brother. Psalms 119 and verse 142. Thou righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Huh. Say that again. Thou righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Huh. And thou law is the truth. Huh. And the law is the truth. So Azariah understands that this judgment that's coming upon them is according to the law. So these judgments are being judged against them according to the laws that were broken of the Most High. So he understands this, and he understands that they are worthy of death for these things, right? So is there any more on that? Con. So we get back to verse 5 in the prayer of Azariah, right? And it says, according to the truth and judgment, didst thou bring all these things upon us because of our sins. You see that? So because of our sins. So we broke those laws, those statutes, those, those commandments. Now let's go to verse six on here. It says, for we have sinned and committed inequity, departing from thee. So he's admitting that we sinned. We committed sin and inequity, departing from the most high's ways, right? Brother, let me get first John three and four. So now we're going to go into verse seven of Azariah. It says, in all things have we trespassed and not obeyed thy commandments. I'm going to say that again. In all things have we trespassed and not obeyed thy commandments, nor kept them, neither done as thou hast commanded us, that it might go well with us. Right? You got that, brother? Con. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgress also the law. Con, say that again, bro. Whosoever committed sin transgress also the law. Con, so we see between what is sin, the transgression of the law. What is Azariah admitting to in this prayer? That Israel or Judah specifically has broken the law and committed sin against the Most High by breaking his commandments. So he understands that that is punishable by death. So he understands that. But nonetheless, he's still praying and repenting and, and hoping for the Most High to help them. So we're going to go to verse 8 now of the prayers of Azariah, right? And it says, Wherefore, all that thou hast brought upon us, and everything that thou hast done to us, thou hast done in true judgment. You see that? He has done it in true judgment because he's measuring their actions according to the laws. So whatever happens to them are the punishments for breaking those laws. So that's why it's true judgment. Verse 9. So, uh, brother, let me get Psalms chapter 5, verse 8 in the NLT. Verse 9. 
and thou didst deliver us into the hands of lawless enemies. You guys hear that? The Most High delivered them into the hands of lawless enemies, most hateful forsakers of God, and to an unjust king, and the most wicked in all the world. Now, we're going to go to Psalms 5 verse 8 in the NLT, because David also mentioned something similar to this in a prayer because David understood just as Azariah and these brothers understand what it means to sin and what happens, right? Get that for me, brother. Psalms chapter 5 and verse 8. Lead me in the right path. O Lord, all my enemies will conquer me. Con, read that part again. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Con. So David was praying at that time for his situation, for the Most High to lead him in the correct path. That means without sin, without violating, violating the laws or the statutes, because he understood that if you violated those things, the Most High would judge you and punish you by bringing your enemies upon you, as which is what's happening here to the three brothers, these three Hebrews, and to all of Jerusalem, right? Because Jerusalem behaved wickedly. So the Most High brought Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians down on them, right? So now we're going to go back to verse 10 of the prayer of Azariah. It says, and now we cannot open our mouths. We are become a shame and reproach to thy servants and to them that worship thee. Right? Verse 11. Yet deliver us up, deliver us not up wholly for thy name's sake, neither disannul thy covenant. What's, what's, what he's saying here in verse 11 is, yet deliver us not up wholly. What he's saying is, if you deliver us, don't just set us free or don't just, you know, null and void this punishment. He goes, no, punish us, but don't let us get away free, you know, holy. In other words, uh, punish us, but not to the extent of death, but you must punish us for the sake of your name, right? And then he says, neither disannul thy covenant. In other words, don't void or, or, or dismiss the covenant between us, right? So let's go to verse 12. It says, and cause not thy mercy to depart from us for thy beloved Abraham's sake, for thy servant Isaac's sake, and for the holy Israel's, and for thy holy Israel's sake. Right? This is a righteous brother. The things he's asking for while he's on his near death. Right? So let's go to verse 13. To whom thou hast spoken and promised that thou would have multiplied their seeds as the stars of heaven, right? Because the Most High promised to multiply the seeds of Abraham as the stars of heaven and as the sands of the sea. So let me finish reading this precept, right? So multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand that lieth upon the seashore. Right. So these are blessings that the Most High promised us if we hearken and listen to his word. So now we're going to go to verse 14. Brother, can you bring up Isaiah 40 verse 4? So now we're going to go to 14. It says, for we, O Lord, are become less than any nation and be kept under this day in all the world because of our sins. Now, I want you guys to pay attention to this first sentence. It says, for we, O Lord, are become less than any nation. What that means is that their status and their position as a nation and a kingdom and a people has been to a lowered state. We're going to compare this to what's in Isaiah 40, right? Brother, if you can bring that out, Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted. Okay, stop right there. Every valley. Right. And then there's times it mentions hills and mountains. These hills, mountains and valleys are not literal hills and mountains. These are a people. These are a nations. And this is their state, their position on the earth. So at the moment in this situation, we're a valley. We're at the lowest state, the lowest position among the nations. Right. That's why he says, for we, O Lord, are become less than any nation and be kept under this day. We are under these nations in all the world because of our sins. This is why we gotta wake up, Yasharallah. 
This is why we got to come back, repent and, and, and praise the most high so that we can be raised up as a people out of these valleys and we can become the mountains. We could become those hills in a higher position, in a higher state. But we're always sinning and we're always falling down. Right. I'm going to go now to verse 15 of this, of the prayer of Azariah. It says, neither is there at this time, neither is there at this time prince or prophet or leader or burnt offering or sacrifice or oblation or incense or place to sacrifice before thee and to find mercy. Now, why is he saying that there is no oblation or incense or place to sacrifice before thee? Because Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, when he raided Jerusalem, destroyed Solomon's temple. He brought it down. They burned it and brought it to the ground. So there was no more temple to worship in. There was no more temple to do sacrificial offerings in. Right? So that's why he's saying that. So he says, and I'm going to read it again. Neither is there at this time prince or prophet or leader or burnt offering or sacrifice or oblation or incense or place to sacrifice before thee and to find mercy. Brother, let me get 1 Corinthians 7.10 GNT, uh, NLT. And we're going to go to verse 16 of Azariah. It says, nevertheless, in a contrite heart, and a humble spirit, let us be accepted. You got that, brother? Come. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. For the, for the kind oh, of... Oh. What's going on? Yeah, you got it. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sins and results in salvation. Come. So the kinds of sorrows, right? So a contrite heart is a broken heart, a sorrowful heart. That's how we have to come back to the most high for him to hear us and accept our prayers. We have to be sincere in this thing. There's no playing games. We can't play word games with the most high. We can't say we're sorry and the next day we're doing the same thing again. There's a lot of things that people do in Christendom. They say things with their mouth. They praise God with their mouth. But their actions speak contrary to their beliefs and what they say and what they do and contrary to the Bible and to God's law, statutes and commandments. Right. So we're going to go on to verse 17. Verse 17. Like as in the burnt offerings of rams and bullocks and like as in ten thousands of fat lambs, so let our sacrifice be in thy sight brother let me get psalms 21 verse 7 so ten thousands of fat lambs so let our sacrifice be in thy sight this day and grant that we may wholly go after thee what it means by we may wholly go after thee it means may we go fully after him right for they shall not be confounded that put their trust in thee. Get that for me, brother. Psalms chapter 21 and verse seven. For the king trusteth in the Lord, huh. and though the and through the mercy of the most high, he shall not be moved. Huh. So he will not be moved through trusting in the most high, and we will not be moved in trusting in the most high, right? So let me see, let me read this again. Me, we may fully go after thee for they shall not be confounded that put their trust in thee right we're gonna go to verse 18 was that finished out god all right verse 18 and now we follow thee with all our heart we fear thee and seek thy face right so this fear that they're talking about in verse 18 this fear is what they call the beginning of wisdom the fear of the most high is beginning of wisdom. That without that fear of the most high, you have no platform to gain this wisdom. You need to have fear of the most high as the platform, the springboard to give you the wisdom that you need for this, right? To seek his face. 
Now let's go to verse 19 of the prayer of Azariah. It says, put us not to shame, but deal with us after thy loving kindness and according to the multitude of thy mercies. You know what, bro? Let me get Isaiah 45, 17. All right, and I'm gonna reread verse 19. Put us not to shame. You guys hear that? Put us not to shame, but deal with us after thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy mercies. You got that, bro? Um, Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Khan, you hear that, Yasharala? That's a promise to us that we will be saved and not confounded. But we have to observe his commandments. We have to observe his words to, to, to receive this blessing, right? You know what? I, I want to add a precept to this. Go to John 3, 16, because this is the world that the world talks about in John 3, 16. It's not the whole world. It's this world, the world of Israel, right? So we're going to just read that to show you the true love that the Most High has for his children, for Yasharala. You got that, brother? Tom. Go ahead. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Khan, you see that? Is that, that finished out? Khan. Khan, so you see that, Yasharala? You're the world in John 3, 16. You're the world in Isaiah 45, right? That's not gonna be confounded, a world without end, right? But you have to, you have to for you to receive that, you have to stop sinning. You have to repent to the Most High. Right? And that's what these brothers are doing. So let's go on to verse 20 in uh, Azariah. Right? Brother, if you can get me Matthew 18, verse 6. Right? I'm going to read verse 20 in Azariah. Deliver us also according to thy marvelous works and give glory to thy name, O Lord. And let all them that do thy servants hurt be ashamed. Go ahead, brother, get that. Matthew chapter 18, <coughs> verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, once which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hung about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Khan. You know what, brother? I need you to read that again. Put a little more oomph into that, because that's a powerful precept. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hung about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Khan. And I'm going to reread verse 20 in Azariah. Deliver us also according to thy marvelous works and give glory to thy name, O Lord. And let all them that do thy servants hurt be ashamed. You see this, Yasharala? Anyone who is offending, hurting, disrespecting, killing, or any way or anyhow, giving any negative treatment to any of these little ones, these chosen ones of the Most High, any of these Israelites, these children, right? He's saying that it's better for you to tie a stone to your neck and throw yourself in the ocean than to face him for this. This is strong words coming from the Most High. I would hate to be that person that 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 dropped one of these little ones. And there's another precept in the Bible that mentions, right? Yahusha mentions that these little ones, their angels stand before the throne in heaven. What that means is that anything you do to them is instantly reported to the Most High. And he could he can act right then and there, which happens a lot where they're in the middle of praying and he responds that quickly because their prayers are being heard right then and there and being reported to the Most High right then and there. So he sees it, right? So let's go on to verse 21 of Azariah. It says, And let them be confounded in all their power and might, and let their strength be broken. 
right? Verse 22. Brother, let me get Isaiah 45, verse 5. And verse 22. And let them know that thou art God, the only God, and glorious over the whole world. So he's praying to let the enemies know, let the whole world know, right? The literal whole world. Let them know that he is the only true God. Go ahead, brother. Bring that out. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse five. five. I am the Lord and there is none else. Say that again. Brother. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I greeted thee, though thou hast not known me. Khan, there is no other God outside of Yahweh, the true God, the true creator of the earth. The holy father of the his the Israelites, right? So now, <laughs> man, I get goosebumps just reading that. Come. So let's go to verse 23 of Azariah, right? It says, and the king's servants that put them in ceased, right? These are the servants that put the three Hebrews in into the fire. It says the king's servants that put them in ceased not to make the oven hot with rosin. Let me reread that. And the king's servants that put them in ceased not to make the oven hot with rosin, pitch, tow, and small wood. So what that means is they made the fire hotter, bigger than it, what it was originally, right? So now we're going to go to verse 24. So that the flame streamed forth above the furnace, 40 and nine cubits. Now, just so, I, so you guys understand, 40 and 9 cubits is 74 feet. 74 feet. Right. So this fire was so huge, it went up 75 feet. Just so you people can understand what that is, that's the size of a five-story apartment building in New York City. That's how big this fire was. And if you ever pass by a car fire that's only 10 feet high, and it's so hot that it burns you from 30 feet away, imagine a fire that big. That's how angry this king was. In fact, brother, let me get Daniel chapter 3, verse 22. Right? Daniel chapter 3 and verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo. Huh. So the fire was so hot that it killed the men that were dragging them to the furnace. That's how hot it was, right? Let's go to verse 25 here in Azariah. It says, and it passed through and burned those Chaldeans. It found about the furnace. So all those men that dragged them there were killed by the heat of this fire, right? We're going to go to verse 26 now. Brother, if you can, if you could pull up the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 23, NLT. Right? And it, verse 26 says, But the angel of the Lord came down into the oven together with Azariah and his fellows and smote the flame. Smot means to kill. And he smot the flame of the fire out of the oven. So this angel came down with Azariah and the other brothers and, and blew out this flame, right? So now let's get that Jude. Jude chapter one and 23. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to steal others, but do so with great caution, heeding Hating the sins that contamin contaminate their lives. Kind. So basically, he snatched them as kindling out of the fire. Right? Brother, if you could also bring up Zechariah chapter 3. And you're going to read verse 2 and 3 in KJV. Right? So that's what it's like for us, man. We're living in this world. We're always in a situation, whether we are a part of it or not. And the Most High, if we're repentant or if we're not doing anything wrong, in most cases, he will snatch us out of the fire, man. Sometimes we got to die for this thing, but we still, we still have a great inheritance. Go ahead, brother. 
Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Huh. Verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angels. Con. So you see this, right? So this is <laughs> this is like he's calling uh, Nebuchadnezzar the devil at this point, right? If you make this comparison, this is what it's like. And these filthy rags are the sinful nature of 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 you know the people. That's what these filthy rags are. And he's snatching them out of the fire, right? And he's going to remove those filthy rags from them because they're repentant. So I'm going to go on to verse 27 of Azariah. It says, And made the mist of the furnace as it had been a moist whistling wind, so that the fire touched them not at all, neither hurt nor troubled them. You see that? So the angel saved them from out of the fire. So we're going to go to verse 28. And it says, Then the three, as out of one mouth, praised glorified and blessed God in the furnace saying blessed art thou O Lord God of our fathers and be praised and exalted above all forever right so they're giving thanks to the most high they're praising the most high now I just want to show you something right we're going to keep reading this because Azariah is going to make a list of 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 situations of praise to the most high right but at the same time we're also going to use the bible in psalms and i want you all to see that the apocrypha and the bible go hand in hand harmoniously right so brother if you can um get psalms 148 and you're going to start at verse one and we're going to go verse for verse out of the Apocrypha and out of Psalms, back and forth, right? So we could prove that this is harmonious and in the same spirit, right? Because it was the same people, the same spirit, and the same God who, who had these inspirational things written down. So you're going to start at verse 1. Go ahead. Psalms chapter 148 and verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Khan. And I'm going to read in Azariah, verse 29, Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, and be praised and exalted above all forever. Right? That sounds like it's in the same paragraph almost, right? So now you go to verse 2 of Psalms. Psalms 148 and verse 2. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Khan. And I'm going to go to verse 37 of Azariah's prayer in the Apocrypha. It says, O ye angels of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Right? You can go to verse 4. Psalms 148 and verse 4. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Con. And this is verse 38 in Azariah, the three Hebrews. It says, O oh, all ye waters that are that be above the heaven, bless ye the Lord, praise and exalt him above all forever. You do uh, verse 3. Psalms 148 and verse 3. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Con, and I'll do verse 40 in Azariah. Uh, Azariah says, O oh, ye sun and moon, bless ye the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Right? So, um, did we go to Psalm 66 for? Give us, Shalaki, give us one second. Did we do that one? 66 for? Wow. All right, let's do Psalm 66 for. Psalm 66 in verse 4. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thou name Salah. Khan. And I'm going to go to verse 35 in Azariah. 
O all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. You see this? If you didn't know this was in two different books, you would think they're all in the same chapter. That shows you the harmoniousness and, and the same spirit of, of, of the writings in the Apocrypha and in the regular Bible. All of these things in praising the Most High God, right? So I'm going to read the last verse in Azariah, right? It's verse 67. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord Yahweh, because he is gracious, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, all ye that worship the Lord, bless the God of gods, praise him, and give him thanks, for his mercy endureth forever. These are powerful prayers. They're all in the spirit. Now, I want to add something to this that's related at the same time. A lot of people, when they know the story about the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't understand that those three names are not their original names. Even Daniel, right? His name in that same, uh, same book of Daniel is not Daniel. It's called Belteshazzar. When they went into captivity under the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, they changed their names, right? Why did they change their names? I'll, t I'll show you, right? Daniel's name, the meaning of Daniel's name is God or Yahweh is my judge. So the Babylonians have their own gods. So they can't have Hebrews in there with names that confess the true God. So they changed the names. So Daniel's name under the captivity was called Belteshazzar, right? Just in case you don't know that. Now there's a meaning to this name, just like his original name. But this one is for a false god. It means Bel will protect, right? That's what it means because the Babylonians had a, had a god called Bel, right? Who ironically Daniel killed, or this, should I say, ironically, Daniel had uh, the king destroy it and the priest later on. Now, we'll go to, um, we'll go to Abednego, right? His real name is Azariah. That's why you keep hearing me say the prayer of Azariah. So this is Abednego's prayer, right? So Abednego, right? If we look his name, his name, Hananiah, means Yah has been gracious, right? But they changed his name to Abednego, and that means servant of Nego or servant of Nebo, right? Which is another god of the Babylonians, right? So now if we go to Meshach, right? Meshach's name, his real name is Mishael. And his name means who is what, who is what God is, right? And then they changed it to Meshach and it says belonging to Aku, Aku is the the language and the the name of our Arcadian Sumerian uh, god. There's two gods that I can think of. One was called Marduk, right? And if we look in the in the Apocrypha in the story of Bel and the Dragon, right? Then we know that it was also the dragon that was there that was also called Aku. So that's another thing, right? So. Then we have Meshach, Hananiah, Mashiel, and Daniel. But if you don't know this, you don't know they're the same people. They're the same characters, but under the captivity of the Babylonian king, their names were changed. They try to change their identities because what they did was they changed the names and the meaning of the names and try to indoctrinate them because they were there and they were going to study three years the language, the history, so that they can help run the kingdom in the offices, right? But they had to indoctrinate them. So they wanted them to become like the meanings of their names, right? So this is your brother Manatazak and brother Paul, right? So we hope that this was an edifying class, a motivational class to inspire our brothers to continue in the work and to do the righteous acts that the Most High has given us and to always speak as the oracles of the Most High God and Shalom.